uh, Robert, of course, and uh, Christoph. Uh, great to have you uh, present at the event and be one of our friends and uh, help uh, share knowledge with uh, the industry in this uh, different time. Uh, so great to have you on board and great to uh, yeah, present your your technology here and help uh, help who needs uh, to evolve with their their game. So over to you guys. Okay. Chris, you might start with, with telling a little bit about yourself before we jump in. Sure. So I'm I'm Chris. I'm founder and CTO over here at um, Photon Engine, formerly known as Exit Games. So that was the original name we gave the company back in 2003. Um, because we, in fact, we always built middleware even 17 years ago. So the idea was always to build uh, middleware back in the days for mobile phones. But um, yeah, we we actually built games to, to use our own technology. So then at, about 10 years ago, we launched Photon and we solely focus on this product. And we tend to call ourselves Photon Engine and, and people know us uh, under this brand and Exit Games gets more and more in, in the background. Um, yeah, we are solely focused on on building multiplayer technology, and we, we I think we have some interesting things to share or some some ideas we want to share with with everyone here today. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, I'm Robert Boom, uh, working as a photon evangelist because we, as we have said before, we don't sell or we don't uh, luckily don't need to sell our tech anymore. Um, I'm evangelizing, so I'm, I'm telling uh, people about the advantages and uh, disadvantages of our different products and which is the best way to go. And um, I'm with these guys since, since more or less forever, since 2004, and I never lost uh, to touch to be in touch with them and um, I run my own game studio as well um, for a couple of years um, and worked with uh, quite famous brands like Gianna Sisters and Bomberman and why I'm mentioning Bomberman I will come to this uh, a little bit later uh, because today we don't want to talk too much about ourselves we want to tell you about a new way to create multiplayer games, uh, which doesn't need netcode, so no netcode anymore to create multiplayer games. Um, just some um, some words for the introduction. Uh, takes a little bit until it loads here. So Chris already said, said we are a middleware company, so we build networking engines and we run a, a cloud service uh, to run those multiplayer games um, globally. So we have about how many are, how many regions do we have? 12, 15, I, I don't know. So all over the world, even, even in, in, in China, you can can be a single guy and you can build a game with our tech, a multiplayer game with our technology and can run it globally, which is really amazing. And uh, back in the days when I ran my own game studio, there wasn't the cloud, there was just a Photon server, which is the foundation for our cloud and uh, which was painful. And now it's so super easy and it's a pretty successful approach. We have 450,000 registered developers. We have about 500 million, well, it's a crazy number, 500 million monthly active users uh, playing the games of our customers in our cloud. And it's about four petabytes of traffic um, uh, we, we handle each month. Quite, quite crazy, quite successful, quite famous, and we are really proud of it. Mm. During COVID times, there was a crazy peak as, as well. So we, we had a 30% uh, uh, uplift in, in, in um, uh, concurrent users. So our, our model is based on concurrent users. And we had about, I think, 1 million, uh, Chris, mm -hmm. right? 1 yep. million concurrent users. At the same time, uh, Steam announced that they had 20 million. So it's it's, it's not bad for for a uh, small company from Hamburg, Germany, <laughs> uh, which is pretty great. But yeah, let's let's uh, jump into the topic. Uh, 
don't talk too much about. So, yeah, we wanted to tell you about. A, it's always good to have an idea, Robert. So that's uh, totally fine. Thanks. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> of course. So not everyone knows us. So I mean, we are all in game. So most people know us, but sometimes. Yeah, and um, I always I'm pretty proud of what we have achieved. So I like to tell it. Actually. And you can be I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry for that. So, uh, no. but we, today we want, want to talk about uh, new ways to to create multiplayer games, and there are different strategies. And um, Chris, please explain what what are the most common strategies and what's the new one then. And I will always jump in and, and yeah. ask some questions. Of course, I'm heavily biased, <laughs> but uh, it's also my role here to, to ask questions when, when we do some strategic decisions, why we do this and that, and this is a good idea. So I'm always asking Chris some fierce questions sometimes. So, so okay. uh, yeah, just to give an overview, so very simplified, very condensed. So we. Uh, we work in this space or focus on this space since 10 years. So and there's always innovation happening. So on all fronts. So um, and I break it down into three components, basically, when it comes to multiplayer development. So the, the first component you need, you, you want to have a fast transport um, to send data between devices fast. So this is what everybody needs because in the end devices are distributed and you want to connect them. So there are three main protocols evolving or dominating there. So the, the, the most important one is UDP, which is a de facto standard for performance and you can send stuff unreliable. So this is this is a non plus ultra for all the AAA studios. So then you have uh, secure web sockets or web sockets, which is a de facto becoming the de facto standard for for companies. So uh, going fine through firewalls, um, being TCP based, which has a disadvantage compared to UDP because it's always reliable and it doesn't give you, let's say, the the absolute edge in terms of latency and everything. And then the new UDP in the web browser, which is WebRTC, which is not only covering UDP or allowing UDP based transport, but video covering video and voice and becoming the de facto. So probably what we are seeing here with the video and voice we are we are talking about is most likely WebRTC in your browser. So or this our is our beloved what, uh, what, Discord channel. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So so this is um, this is becoming a commodity. So we are very good in that space for so all the 500 million users and everything. So this is our transport layer, our protocol. So we, we, we do this, but it's becoming a commodity. You will get this from, from a lot of providers at some point. It's like a web server, right? At some point, you're not going to reinvent a web server anymore. So then on top of this transport, you build synchronization and, and the de facto standard for the past, I don't know, 20 years since forever is state sync state synchronization. So you're synchronizing objects, positions, so everything that moves on your screen that you're controlling, you're synchronizing. So there are different terms for it. I call it state sync. It's, sometimes it's um, state transfer. It can be client authoritative, uh, authoritative, server authoritative. So there were games along the, the history, like, like Tribes, um, Halo, Counter Strike, so and and it got better and better and better, right? And the latest maybe is is Fortnite with Unreal Engine networking. So all this is using this technique. Um, most of our products are in fact using the same idea and and being advanced, right? And you can for infinite you can innovate there and make it better and better. So what we want to talk about today is is a different strategy. So instead of synchronizing state you can uh, synchronize input. So an input is everything you, you, how you control your game. So it can be keyboard input and mouse input. It can be a controller um, on, a, on a mobile phone. It would be the touch screen and on a VR system, it would be the hand controllers and the position of the hand. So with that, in the end, you are interfacing with the game. And instead of synchronizing everything in the game, you are synchronizing only the input. And we got um, fascinated by this 
something um, four years ago and started to experiment. And we think it's going to trigger a revolution in multiplayer development. Yeah, and I, I was pretty, you know, I, I've just said that I've developed uh, games on my own multiplayer games and I was working on the original Bomberman brand and um, and there are so many super successful games and even our success is most mostly uh, using state sync. So most of our products are using this approach. And so I was a little bit skeptical in, <laughs> in the beginning. Um, so does it really make sense? Will it lead to some successful route? So, and why is not anyone already doing it, right? So what, what is, why is that? So I was pretty skeptical in, in the beginning, actually. Um, but um, maybe Chris can, can a little bit better explain why it's a good approach or what, what is the difference or why, why is state sync not good enough? Yeah, if you if you flip uh, to the next yeah. uh, slide, um, so we have the, I can support my explanations. So, so the state sync, you have all these distributed devices. Let's say you have a game with sixteen players, and you need to make sure everything is in sync, right? And there are a lot of moving objects. Um, and bullets and hits and collecting items, right? So this is this is a challenge. So with with this input sync approach, this is what a developer sees. It, it, it's one simulation, and it looks like all the input devices. So in this case, let's take a console, right, with a controller or a PC. It looks like all the controllers are attached locally. So there is literally no net code. Net code is a term for writing code that uses sockets, right? Synchronizes stuff over the network. So this is this is a profession in its own. So you need really experts to deal with it. Um, so this doesn't exist in this other model because it looks like you have a local multiplayer game. You just, you build a local game with four controllers in this picture or 16 controllers attached. Um, so the advantage is you build a game, single player, local multiplayer, online multiplayer, there's no difference for you as a developer anymore. And um, uh, state sync, looking at Fortnite or all the or Fall Guys and all the successful games out there, it's not bad in any way, right? It's just very, it's getting very, very sophisticated and very hard for teams to make this really great. And one of the holy grails of multiplayer development is networked physics, meaning um, in Fall Guys, Fall Guys, you see it per excellence, right? So you have 64 people completely interacting, hit by obstacles, and everything is is networked physics, right? Or car racing games, you are trying to to push another car off the street, and all this multiplayer handling the latency. This is really really hard. Um, and this doesn't exist in this uh, model because everything is a local physics engine. Um, so there is no, you don't have to think about synchronizing stuff. That's just one simulation. So when it's, the simulation is running on the clients and there's no server involved. Yeah, so this picture gives you the, the, the view of the developer, right? So, and, and the next uh, picture we prepared is basically what, what is happening behind the scenes because you, you probably would ask, okay, so where's the multiplayer no coming multiplayer. into play? <laughs> right? So, and this is how it looks in the network. In this case, you have three players all run the exact same simulation and behind the scenes, the controller input is, is synchronized. So you... Uh, when you develop the game, this is you, you, you weren't aware of that. So it's just, um, it's just automatically, let's say, scaling across devices. Um, so it, 
it may uh, may sound too good to be true, but it's like like Robert said, we were skeptical four years ago, and we we went on and on, and then recognized, wow, this is. I think this has potential to revolutionize the space. Um, there are a lot of challenges, performance, um, deter cross device determinism, like a lot of details. Let's say we 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 could fill uh, like let's say an hour of of talking about it. Um, there is one major limit in this approach, and there's a, because you need to send input to everyone, there's a natural, let's say, limit of currently we limit it to 64 players uh, per game. So if, if you would want to build a game with more than 64 players, maybe 100, right? We don't know exactly. It depends a little bit how efficient you pack input. Um, this will... But but most games, successful games, if you if you go into the app stores, you will see it's not more than sixty four players. It's kind of a natural limit. So so Fall Guys, I think, is in in that dimension. Fortnite is around a hundred. Um, I mean, the the industry tries to lift the bar and get to two hundred, three hundred. Of course, you have MMOs, right, which are using completely different strategies. So this um, technology is not for MMOs for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I still, but there's still latency, and and there's still. So how does it work? So you put input to all, the same input to all devices, and everything simulates the same. So we have already heard about it has to be deterministic, but um, so there must be more to make it happen. Uh, actually, so. Maybe you can give us more glimpse of of what we have built there to make it to make it work. And yeah, so yeah. one 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 thing to, uh, is important. So if let's say you own, I'm I'm sitting in front of my my machine, my console, my PC, my phone, and I'm I'm controlling my character, right? And I I go to the right. I want this to happen instantly. So if this is delayed which was the old lockstep approach right back in the days if this this would this is what people consider as laggy let's say you do mm -hmm. something and it's happening delayed so we solve this part so everything you do is instant and behind the scenes our frameworks are rolling back all the time re-simulating 30 times a second 60 times a second the complete physics pathfinding everything is is running over and over again and we build a system that is able to to be so fast so the simulation are actually sub millisecond execution times to to run a complete simulation cycle so you have enough time for for the rendering to take place so we build this pink block we, we call it simulation which is a pure everything except the rendering so um with physics engine pathfinding um, bot system. So this is a complete turnkey self-contained system, um, which gives you, um, it, it, um, yeah, a turnkey experience, let's say, to build most game types. I mean, we are not trying to solve every, every single problem on the planet and not every gameplay that you can think of. Right. There, there are definitely limits here and there in terms of physics. Um, physics can be incredibly complicated, whatever, liquid physics or, or whatever. Um, car physics is very special. But for example, we build a car physics, right? So we can we can deal with, with racing games or car, car racing games. But as you see here, again, so the only thing that the simulation sees is input. So this this black block, the, the network part, is not available. And that's the, the main advantage of... Um, so we built just for fun, our one of our core guys, Eric, built... Um, we, we saw four guys and were instantly blown away. It's not using Photon, sadly. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> so they built their own tech. They evaluated, uh, the guys evaluated us back in the days. Um, but we built in two days, he built like a, yeah, this on top of our, our engine. And it was super fascinating to see that it's, uh, it's possible to do this. Type yeah. Of thing. And 
and it was super frustrating and on on the one side uplifting and on the other side frustrating when the guys build a bomberman core loop <laughs> which is now part of of our sdk because we were working for a very long time on on making bomberman feel like like bomberman with with the uh, with konami uh, first with hudson soft uh, who were the original ip owners then with uh, konami and it took us I mean, it took us four weeks to get a proper core loop and it felt fine. And then we had to work for, for months to, to, um, yeah, to handle all the edge cases that are happening in, in the multiplayer games because we used state sync and uh, there were some, some issues. And then I saw these guys here creating a Bomberman core loop in, in just a couple of days and it felt instantly great and there were no edge cases anymore and it, it was really frustrating for me on one side because I went through all the pain years ago with my own company and then seeing and this at that time I was completely blown away by the tech and I was totally convinced being skeptical first and then I saw it and then I said okay right that everyone has to understand it there's no netcode anymore you create a game like a single player game and you just plug more players to it. And um, um, but one thing you actually have to, to feel it, you have to, to uh, get your hands on the product yourself and have to experience it yourself to, to believe it. Yeah. That's what, what we always tell people, you have to try it and be convinced that's the, that's the right thing for you. Otherwise it's, uh, so we don't, yeah, like we said in the introduction, we, we don't need to or want to sell it so people have to be convinced uh, of it. And so far, it's going pretty, pretty good. Uh, wait. Right, so far, it's going really, really uh, good. And we have... Um, wait, my... Laptop. My laptop's leggy, not. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, like I said, it's it's going pretty well. So, and and the question is, do we just believe it's a new way to create multiplayer games? Uh, no, hopefully not. And we already could win seventeen professional top teams from all over the world to, to go with with Photon from Square Enix Montreal. From it's, it's quantum Blizzard in teams. particular, right? So that yeah. really. Yeah. Yeah, really this is the, all the new thing. So. Yeah, the new thing, right? And uh, Chris said uh, or talked about limits, but uh, often we find ways to to get around them. Or first, we thought when we started, we thought it just for two D games. So it won't work in three D. Then we added three D physics. Now it's working in three D, and we have even customers doing VR. Uh, 3D FPS uh, shooter games with it, so it's it's pretty pretty amazing. Uh, we have we, uh, where we mm, are now with the technology and yeah, and I I can everyone invite to, to uh, try it. So if anyone wants to, right? Nice. So Twenty minutes. Yeah, pretty good. Very, very good. Uh, pretty, pretty, pretty uh, well on time. I think uh, we can give the audience uh, thanks a lot for that, guys. Uh, very interesting. I, I think we can give the audience uh, the opportunity to ask questions now. So if you have any questions, again, you can ask so via uh, the chat. Uh, Eric uh, Ackerfeld, I see you, you had a question. Could you rephrase that a bit uh, for me so I can relay it uh, in person uh, or better in person? Otherwise, you can always uh, jump in via video by uh, and asking the questions uh, uh, and I um, you just have to hit uh, share audio video and then I will allow you into the session uh, be civil be polite and then we're all good uh, before I remove you again after the question uh, or after the question has been answered if you have a follow-up question so that's all right so if there are any questions at the moment uh, just uh, just shoot that's a question P to P. Yeah, peer to peer. Yeah, yeah, Eric is. Uh, it's directed to you, Chris. Uh, I'm fascinated about the input sync. Can you explain the difference between Bolt and the P2P system? Also, can you elaborate uh, about the latency when you have uh, in out instead of state sync? 
Um, P2P is sometimes the, the word I think is a or it, it can be misleading pretty fast. So for example, if you have a five player game um, in bold, one of the players is the server and the other four, so let's say Jürgen would be the server and, and uh, Sebastian, Robert and I would then connect to, to Jürgen's computer using peer-to-peer. -peer. Technically, it's a client-server architecture because there's a server and there are three clients, right? Um, still, it's using peer-to-peer -to, -peer to peer to peer in this case from, from my PC to connect to Jürgen. So he's maybe behind a router, has a, a nut punch. So I need to try to punch. So maybe his router doesn't allow me to connect and then I need to relay. So technically peer-to-peer -peer can be quite confusing because in a lot of cases it's it's just a connection between two devices des describing this. Right. Um, so this is why Bolt, technically speaking, is a client server architecture, even though if you want to save money, you can use one of the clients as a, as a, as a server. Um, but you can run it dedicated and then you need an orchestration solution like GameEye where you just scale the, the, the dedicated server. Um, in the case of Quantum, Input needs to travel to everyone and we use a relay because it's more efficient, especially if you have 32 players or whatnot. In strictly peer-to-peer, -peer, you would have to send the input. Every client would have to send the input to everyone. So it's more efficient to send it to one place and then this is distributing the, the input. So it's, we don't, so Quantum is using this relay infrastructure we have in place. There's a direct follow-up question before I go to uh, Ravis' uh, question. Uh, Eric uh, follows up with uh, regarding the P2P. Uh, I see. Do you have a host migration built in as well? Yeah. So host migration is if you have a dedicated server uh, architecture and the server which is having an, a major role, uh, basically this is the ultimate truth of the simulation. right? So if this would die, fail, be killed, somebody else. So either you say, okay, the game is dead and somebody else has to take over um, or a new server would have to resurrect the state where it would crash, right? And kind of try to resurrect the game. So you call usually host migration if you use this, this client, listen client so where one of the clients is the server and this is a private guy right so Jürgen says oh I need to go to the toilet closes his game and then all the other guys would be left in the dark because the server is suddenly gone right so this is then you would say oh host migration so now Sebastian's PC takes over dynamically in quantum this doesn't exist because there is just every simulation is 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 the client and the server at the same time it's fully authoritative so every simulation can go away and and nobody cares so uh, so that in that sense um, host migration doesn't exist in the quantum world all right uh, i hope i pronounced this correctly uh, revis gelsbacks uh, he asks desync detection compares what exactly if the client got all the inputs or it compares the state anyway somehow so input, so right, left, up, down, shoot, right, is will will impact the simulation, and the simulation is represented by by everything in the simulation positions, right. So like a simple input can, in an RTS, right, I trigger an attack. It can, in theory, thousands of units could move, and and a lot of things can happen. So when we say um, Check some. We really mean the state is this ex state of the simulation with thousands of objects and and everything. It gives you the exact state, and if you load that state, you have the perfect game. And we do a check some of this uh, thirty or sixty times a second, so we know exactly if if one of the clients is out of sync, and then you can debug. In, in micro level, let's say, to see, oh, there's one unit that is not in sync anymore. Okay, and then you need to get into your code. There are just two ways how a desync can happen. One is hacking, right? One, well, there could be a hacker manipulating the local game state, or 
um, it would be a not deterministic code that would lead to that situation. Okay. I think we got the uh, time for one more. Um, it's from Michael uh, Abspel. Uh, he says at the moment uh, he's building up a tool that uh, analyzes game data, mostly for multiplayer games. Uh, what he needs is uh, the player input from the gameplay to communication in voice. Any tips? Can you guys see the input data? Or can I gather the data from the server? For example, uh, Overwatch has a lot of good parts because everything is kind of integrated. For ex uh, example, the voice. Any tips for uh, Michael? I don't understand. I, I, I don't think I, I have, I understand the, I think I need a bit more time to wrap my head around the question. Michael, if you uh, can explain a bit better, uh, you can come on live as well. I give you uh, two more minutes before we uh, close the session. Uh, maybe that's easier. Uh, otherwise, uh, explain it in the chat a bit better so the guys can wrap their heads around it better. Not an easy one. Sure, I can. <laughs> All right. Let's see. You're, you're, you're uh, able to jump on live. Uh, maybe that's the easiest way, or you're typing it. Asking if voice and statistics are in the same feed to analyze both. Well. Never. I, I mean, you have. Uh, I mean, you control your game. So this is, let's say, traditionally what we would call input. For me, voice is a completely parallel stream. Completely in the. I mean, you talk about the game, of course, right? But it's an independent stream and. I'm not sure how voice and the data are related in this case. Okay. Two Maybe different the... streams of WebRTC, so you can analyze voice via uh, good old Google Translate, I think is what he means. And you have the statistics and both together you will have, you could do things like uh, check if there is uh, toxicity going on in a, in a, in a voice. soft skills in games okay uh, so uh, mm, well you have always a game state the, the in the, so a perfect replay you just need to replay input and you have a perfect you can you can scrub back in time just taking input from a minute ago and replaying it and you have a perfect representation right and you have the voice layer in parallel so you could see if somebody is freaking out I, i'm not sure what soft skills is is that it's not game skills or is it uh, well that, of course you have you you would probably want to see the voice what he was talking about while you see what he was doing in the game maybe freaking out or something i don't know maybe it's like is he an aggressive player is he rushing all the time is he is he more cooperative player or something like that i don't know yeah. Yeah, anyway, it's too much guessing. I think it's an interesting thing, but I think we run out of time. So we have to, <laughs> sadly, <laughs> yeah, we, can, maybe, we cannot maybe find maybe the, the right yeah. answer for you. Sorry for yeah, that. Well, I think yeah. Overall, uh, on the presentation, uh, an overall question, I think the core focus on your side is simplicity, turnkey, uh, make sure that the developer doesn't need to go to university first to start building a, a game and uh, be a, a similar as a Fortnite, have all the netcode guys join the room and start building the game. You really are trying to build something that is a sort of a turnkey environment for all sorts of, uh, of game uh, types, uh, from an indie to maybe a publisher and beyond. Uh, is that correct um, to say so? Yeah. So we try to make it, uh, our claim is make multiplayer simple, right? And this is our mission kind of, <laughs> the simpler, the better. And the more yeah. complicated game types you can build, the better. So that's a quite good summary. Cool.